It's not something that is obvious to many lawyers to host an event about social, political, intellectual activism. The whole idea was to bring together stakeholders that usually wouldn't be in a conversation in their usual professional day-to-day um, -day life. We will hear from university leaders, investigative journalists, filmmakers, NGO activists, academics, judges, musicians, poets, about their experiences of trying to make a difference. I wouldn't normally get a chance to experience an event like this or kind of hear people talking from these backgrounds. To us, it seems almost logical to host an event that asks not so much about what is law, but rather what can law do today to make people's voices heard who have not been heard before. This conference is a coming together of a wide range of disciplines and wide range of vocations where people are thinking about the, the human condition and how it can be improved. This is a kind of opportunity for people to get inspired, to share and to network. And so uh, uh, this is the way um, action happens, I think. We need collectively to take responsibility for them. That's what I want. Um, that, 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 that this whole conference is not just some talking shop, but it moves the world on its axis. The inaugural Transnational Law Summit 2018 takes its cues from different corners and sources of inspiration. As the title alludes to, we owe gratitude and pay our respect to the late political theorist Hannah Arendt, whose work centered around the pertinent question of a political life of participation and intervention, celebrating and taking cues from her 1958 book, The Human Condition, we sought to create a very special initial gathering of thinkers and doers, doers and thinkers. And I'm delighted that this summit really embodies this goal of the law school, with its emphasis on dialogues between different sites of engagement and agency, states and regions, international organizations, NGOs, cities, courts, social movements, universities, colleges, schools, and the media. You're all represented here, and I welcome all of you to King's. Our first speaker tonight, Dr. Shirin Ebadi, has been a tireless fighter for human rights, political freedom, and gender equality. It is indeed a privilege for me to be here at a time when there are politicians around the world who are speaking about closing borders and erecting walls to separate people. I'm afraid of those who try and divide us as our world and their world, our interests and their interests, our culture and their culture, and thus driving us apart. We should not allow such a wall to be erected within our hearts. Oh, she's such a strong lady, you know. It proves that after, even after 40 years of Islamic uh, dictatorship, there still are champions of free thought around. And uh, well, that's that's great to see her and to to hear, listen to her. Uh, wonderful. We're going to get right into it because we have a stacked agenda for this morning's discussion. First, uh, we have Guy Standing. Guy is a prof professorial research associate at SOAS, University of London. He's also founding member and honorary co-president of the Basic Income Earth Network. All my professional life, 
I've been advocating that we should move towards a society where every person has basic income security. We need to distinguish between good growth and bad growth. What we need to assess the health of an economy are qualitative indicators of poverty, health, equity, education, social inclusion, the environment and so on. None of which can be reduced to money coefficients. In my view, this is a key condition for achieving economic and environmental justice. A basic income would enable people to spend more time doing activities that would help preserve the resources, caring for people in and around the family, in and around the community. These are activities that make a good society, damn it. I salute Pierre and his colleagues for setting up this summit, and I hope it will be one of many. Thank you. Younger workers today expect to hold a series of jobs and really don't think that their jobs they get are going to have either security or social benefits. That we really need to remake social institutions to match this new reality. We need to broaden our concept of what labor law is all about and include other areas of law and include areas that have to do with migration and that have to do with health and the environment and, and think beyond the global north and, and to the global south and trade and that labor issues really are human issues and human rights issues and so what this conference is doing is bringing all of these different constituencies together. It's got to be translated into political and social and cultural and economic action. That is very hard to predict and very hard to achieve, but I think there's an awful lot of people here who are determined to make events happen. What am I called to do as a lawyer, say, in my case, in response to a grave crisis like climate? What are we going to do in order to meet this crisis and to change the world for our children? We've done fundamental damage to the planet. We've fundamentally changed the functioning of the planet. And in doing so, of course, we've fundamentally undermined ourselves. After being caught with their pants down in the global financial crisis, uh, the Bank of England was determined to identify systemic risk early in the future, not when it was too late. And they identified climate change as the next systemic risk. We wanted to raise climate consciousness among those who we could connect with. So because I'm a songwriter, I figured that well, it was a good place to start. Well, I think it's really important that we figure out cultural ways to tell these stories, the stories of communities, the stories of loss, and the stories of hope. Good day to all of you. My name is Janis Staffansson. I belong to Sami, the indigenous peoples of Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia. The world continues to consume in an unsustainable way and it still violates the rights of indigenous peoples and those who are the most affected and first affected. Action on climate change, we need to engage all levels. We need to act internationally, we need to create social movement for change, we need to change as individuals, but we also need governments to actually do what they said they will do. This is our panel on demanding environmental justice. And, and the point of this panel is to look at how you build grassroots movements and then our organisation was established to try and ensure that the whole of the UK pensions industry was accountable to ordinary citizens and members. Because as we know, the financial industry is day in and day out having an enormous impact on environmental uh, justice issues. Within developing countries, 
the poor people suffer more from climate change and climate injustice than the richer people. So our main goal these five past years has been building those grassroots communities into seeing that what happens globally has an impact on their livelihoods at the local level. Let's keep fighting because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere and we are here to fight for justice globally. We often start thinking about migration as though it's an exception. We have words, we describe it such as crisis, as though it's happening just at this moment. But it's good to just step back and think about in terms of human history. It is actually not exception. It is the part of human condition. Migrants, ways, routes, maps, refugees, lines and borders, borders and fences. Borders and fences, and humans. Humans who became titles and numbers. When I first joined the Coast Guard, it was in 2001, after the NATO war in Afghanistan. So for the first time, we saw people from uh, Central Asia. One of the things that mobilizes me and galvanizes me is the increase in rhetoric and the increase in sort of vitriol around people simply because they are crossing a border. Many of my colleagues in the summer of 2015, their daily routine is to pick up bodies from the water. It wasn't a surprise anymore. We would go to the morning route and patrol, pick a couple of bodies, perhaps a kid. He's still on mine with my wife and the other baby, the other child. You hold the other child and throw him and ask my wife, now you will jump also. And he returned back into Turkey. Who is the refugee? They are humans with a name. They are nothing but men, children, and women, among them scientists or illiterate, doctors and peasants, plumpers and housewives. They do have a name. He take our bags, the bags contain baby food, contain uh, some document, some, some money for us. I called the Coast Guard and they said, I asked them, I don't know where I am. I had the, the, chain, the chance to share the panel with a pharmacist from Syria that actually crossed illegally the borders from Turkey to Greece, that we could have been met there. I could have arrested him. This is a unique opportunity to interact with these people without any tension. I stay in, uh, in uh, Greece about four months. I try to find a smuggler to travel safely uh, with my wife and the child by the plane, but I didn't find. Do you create your own, carve your own, or draw your own borders within it, or do you sort of come together and listen to people's stories and then start to ask if, if I believe in the right of this person to be here, and I believe in this person's humanity. All of us, I think it's fair to say, are trying to capture <laughs> questions of justice and to explore questions of inequality and migration through telling stories about ourselves and about other people. As a writer and as a traveller, the reason I write and travel is because I want to explore the full range of what it means to be human. These people have gone far beyond anything I've ever seen. And they've got so much to offer. They've got so much wisdom to offer. Hannah Arendt was a refugee. Einstein was a refugee. The people who are warning us about the dangers of totalitarianism, about the, the dangers of inequality, about the, the way in which you know, society is constructed and and needs to be more humane, often are refugees. The challenge of the migrant crisis in terms of the lessons of, of Hannah Arendt is that we is seeing those people as human. So what she talked about was how identity is a relationship between 
one person and another. So I can demonize you, but if I do demonize you, there's a loss to me as well. I'm, there's something in me that is dehumanized too. Um, we have four uh, amazing poets here, um, and uh, I honestly, I'm a little bit giddy just being in the same room as them, while I'm getting to introduce them to you. But my mom worked as a nurse in the hospital. And so she talks a lot about working in the hospital as a nurse and caring for people. I'm very angry at the fact that when my mother came over, she was, a, she was considered a British citizen. She was invited here. Um, and that now people of my mom's generation are being deported because of immigration changes. So I'm doing this poem because I'm livid about that, livid. Some days she wanted to crawl back into her mother's belly, her little island home, and be safe. Some days she wished she had stayed in that small place because if you study the damn dogs in this place, they go bite you up and break you down every day. You feel like your teeth cracking on hard, stale cassava bread. This place ain't winning at all. It's like they don't realize we still have a home to go back to. Our third reader tonight is J.J. Bola. He is Kinshasa born and London raised. He's been much lauded for the work that he's done using poetry to speak up for refugees in this country and around the world. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I wrote this poem called Tell Them. And when they turn the bodies over to count the number of closed eyes and they tell you 800,000, you say no. That was my uncle. He wore bright coloured shirts and pointy shoes. Two million, you say no, that was my auntie. Her laughter could sweep you up like the wind to leaves on the ground. Six million, you say no, that was my mother. Her arms, the only place I have ever not known fear. So when they tell you that you come from rape, you say no. And you tell them about every time you have ever loved. Tell them that you are from mother, carrying you on her back until you could walk until you could run, until you could fly. Tell them that you are from father, holding you up to the night sky full of stars and saying, look, child, this is what you are made of. From long summers, full moons, flowing rivers and sand dunes, you tell them that you are an ocean that no cup could ever hold. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed having those beautiful poems read. To hear how their work works as well, to hear how they progress, to hear how different it might be to our line of work as academics, scholars, lawyers, but how much we can learn from them. When you're thrown into an environment with lots of different thinkers, people who are talking from different perspectives, that's when creative change happens. When you as a human read the story of somebody who survived something, experienced something, has a story to tell that you previously had not thought about, that changes your perspective in a very permanent way. Thank you. I think Angela Davis said something like, everything is political. I come from Chile. I was born during dictatorship and I, I was raised with this fear of speaking up of, about things, and, but the urgency of actually doing it, go beyond that fear because it's necessary to have this, what you're doing today, to have a conversation, to ex express ourselves and what we think it's not right. So. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce our guest, Dexter Diaz, QC. Dexter is a barrister who, as a QC, has been instructed in some of the most important cases in recent years involving human rights, murder, terrorism, and crimes against humanity. He has been instrumental in changing the law to protect young women and girls at risk of female genital mutilation. I met an amazing, brave woman in Boston, I was doing research at Harvard, who was risking her life to raise awareness about FGM. And she's doing that to try and protect girls across an ocean who she will never meet. 
Why do we do that? And I think that is really interesting because with all the doom and gloom that seems to suffuse this age of anxiety, and I see from the research I do, from the cases I do, the other side of it, which is human beings constantly striving, fighting, yearning for something better. What you're about to see is a song which is called Women Are Not sugarcane, not to be chewed up and spat out. <laughs> Before the start of this afternoon, I said to my neighbour, this had better be really good, I'm very tired. <laughs> and it was, it was uh, inspiring listening to the stories of the QC, because I mean, we need the logic, but we're human, we also need the inspiration, and that has been very well judged. to participate in this event, I felt challenged to think about Arendt, and not only about my court rulings and my files and courts and institutions and all that. And I proposed to talk about the practice of doing justice in courts, because I thought Arendt is about action. So that's what I'm going trying to do. And I wanted to pose questions to you, because I want to win you over to become friends of courts. This keynote carries the title Democracy in Peril, and what I want to do is to call on you to help save and strengthen and live an ever better democracy by becoming a friend of constitutional courts in particular. In times of populist politics, the importance of law in our society is scarily obvious. Law is needed when democracy is at risk. It's scary how far you get without an independent court being able to stop anyone anymore. The media and the academy and the courts are, if they work properly, the counter-majoritarian forces in what is generally run by majority vote. If they go down, we do too. So my only point is engage in critical lawyering because constitutionalism is a collective practice and it needs you. Thank you very much. Lawyers, because of their status in society, because we've got that social capital, we need to use it uh, for for the good. I, mean, I don't want to sound too much like Star Wars. We need to actually. I do. We need to use it to fight the dark side. Isn't it's truth. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about action, I think that's really great. What I've heard so far from everyone, like the kind of the themes, the recurrent themes have been like bottom up, kind of like grassroots action, you know, to overturn the kind of negative political landscape that we're in. We feel we've built a kind of post-war institutional framework of justice and human rights that's serving us. It's not. I mean, inequalities are growing. I think activists and scholars need to come together and push each other's work more. I hope that similarly, just as, as the work of academics and scholars enters the classroom, that the work of activism enters scholarship. I think we have to fight on all levels, locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, because you can only, I think you should start from where you are. As you know, this section brings together scholars, activists, and advocates from a variety of geographies who share a commitment to working towards secure housing in their locality. We will start with Navneet. Hi, everyone. So my name is Navneet Graywall, and I, um, just to, to let you guys know where I'm coming from, I'm a senior attorney with, uh, at the Western Center on Law and Poverty, and we work statewide across California. I'm speaking here 
partly first as someone who was an anti-eviction housing rights activist in Delhi for many years, and now finds himself on the other side of the police barricade, working with governments to make housing policy. And it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I work in preventing evictions and attempting to upgrade people's living conditions in homes they currently have. The thing that got me to work on housing, I always worked with social movements, but um, this is actually my neighborhood in Sao Paulo. I think international solidarity of, of all types is important, but I think we also need to recognize, and I guess the speakers were saying that really, is by their very definition, I think housing campaigns are local. You know, because they're about people's homes and communities. It's the first summit that I've been to where there's, where there's local advocates from different cities across the world that are coming together to discuss how we do our work and it's not having people talk at you but rather collaborating and talking with each other about potential solutions and ideas. The campaign was formed weeks, uh, days after the fire. It's been tough. We've had 10 months where our whole lives have been changed completely. Almost a year on, only 80 households have been housed permanently, given permanent housing. There still are almost 100 people in hotels a year on. The council has spent 21 million they could have built Grenfell three times. As someone who's been brought up in London and seen the kind of disparity grow deeper throughout my life, Grenfell Tower really signified everything that was kind of wrong in society. But then going on like silent marches and looking at that community and how you know, they've responded to that is really hopeful. You know, people all meeting together gives you like a sense of purpose. And actually, if you're not taking anything back with you from where you come from, or you know, even if you're here, then what's the point? If this conference can evolve into a forum for sharing ideas between activists and academics, um, the practical and the theoretical, then I think it will have achieved something useful. Hello everyone, welcome to, um, to this roundtable uh, plenary discussion about um, activism and journalism in relation to politics and, and democracy. The type of journalism that you have in the global north is not the same as that one that you have in the, in the, in the global south. How do you, as a victim, for instance, write about the plight of your people in a dispassionate manner, in an objective manner, in a detached manner? That is impossible. I was trained as a journalist uh, in Congo, uh, working for the Associated Press, where I witnessed and wrote about uh, the destruction of the free press in Rwanda through the lives of my students and colleagues who were imprisoned, tortured, killed, uh, forced to flee the country. I think in our choice of subject, in our, the choice of topics that we report on as journalists, we take on uh, a very important activist uh, role in serving as a voice for the population and serving as a check on power. <laughs> Seeing so many people together who are um, working towards uh, more justice brings optimism to, to the world. Hannah Arendt conceptualized action as a key ingredient of human relationships, focusing on the polis, the public's fear of meaningful and collective human action. We need to build a polis by putting ourselves in someone else's shoes to think about what we are doing to feel what they're feeling and to resist together. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. People here talked about mostly very concrete ways of turning ideas into something practical. I'm really happy about this, yeah.
and I'm really grateful to the people that came. The sort of people that are coming to this summit, and I hope it continues in, to build on what has started magnificently, are the type of people who are, they may not have the correct answers, but they're asking the correct questions. Are we really doing enough at Scholars when it comes to understanding our work and how we can actually implement it in the real world? We have to go out there and put this discussion uh, away from auditorium and university rooms. Uh, I use as an example, I have to go to the village of my father when a lot of people there are quite old and they're afraid of this uncertainty and they, they feel that they don't have the power to start again. So we have to go there and give them hope first and take the discussion from this warm room to the real world. Archimedes said, if you give me a lever and a place to stand and I will shift the world. <laughs>